Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of FitRx. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Dennis, and uh, very excited about today's guest. Um, Mr. Jimmy Moore is very well known in the keto community. He has written several books, um, including Keto Clarity, The Keto Cure, uh, Cholesterol Clarity. We're going to kind of touch on each of those today. He also has multiple podcasts. Uh, Living La Vida Low Carb is a, a very successful podcast. Uh, so look forward uh, to my visit with him. So Mr. Moore, welcome to the show. Oh, Mr. Moore is my dad, dude. Call me Jimmy. And <laughs> Hi, Greg. Okay, very good. Very good. Um, well, okay. Well, as we get started, I'm just anxious to kind of hear your story. So, uh, you know, let's go back at the beginning and, you know, tell the listeners how you discovered, uh, you know, the, the ketogenic diet and, uh, and, and how that evolved for you over the years to becoming now really a, a, an expert um, in this area. Yeah, so I just passed 17 years of what I call live in La Vida Low Carb. Uh, I went on a New Year's resolution to lose weight back in 2005. Uh, and I had read many diet books over the years, and most of them were predicated on cut your calories, cut your fat, exercise, really all of these things that everybody has heard about their whole life. And that particular Christmas, I got a diet book for Christmas that year. Isn't that lovely? Um, not so subtle in the, I uh, think you're fat and you need to lose some iron. Um, and so I'm reading this book. It was Dr. Atkins' New Diet Revolution. And I'm thinking, oh, this is the heart attack doctor. Because everybody had this like assumption that if you eat his diet, you're going to get a heart attack. Because unfortunately, he did die on a slip and fall accident but they all uh, believed that he died of a heart attack and that's what made him slip and fall. Anyway, so there were a lot of like trepidations when I started reading this book, but I start reading it and I go, whoa, okay, this guy's a cardiologist and he's saying eat more of the very thing we know that clogs your arteries and gives you heart disease. I know we're going to talk about cholesterol here in a minute and I have lots to say on that subject, but I'm like, okay, okay. saturated fat is okay. Uh, 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 okay, cool eat less carbs and I'm going, well, wait a minute. Will not I be sluggish all day? What? Like we've been told you need carbs for energy. It was like bass backwards of everything I'd ever heard of before when it came to nutrition. But I kept thinking I've never felt good on any of those other low fat, low calorie exercise to you drop diets. Why the hell not try this one? And so January 1st, 2004, that's exactly what I did. Uh, I started on the Atkins diet and the first three days sucked and I was having major what they now call keto flu, but it was, uh, I, I didn't know anything about electrolyte. I didn't know anything about health or nothing. I went from, and I actually did the calculations, Greg, uh, one time lately, uh, of what I used to eat in a day. Hold on to your hats, you guys. I used to eat upwards of 1500 to 1600 grams of carbohydrate a day because I would go Coca-Cola like it was going out of style and I'd eat not just a few little Debbie snack cakes. I'd eat boxes at a time. I'd have not just a few Oreo cookies, the whole damn packet. Like people that don't understand this mentality of binge eating and, and the carbohydrate addiction, it's real. It's very real. And so I got to weigh 410 pounds doing all that. And so I went from oh. 1,500 grams of carbohydrate down to 20, which is the prescription for induction phase of the Atkins diet. And it was murder. Like I, I've never taken drugs in my life, but if I ever had to detox from like crack cocaine, I think I know kind of sort of what it feels like because that sugar was just screaming at me, dude. We're starving. And, but it only took a few days, maybe three, four days later, I'm going, oh, you know, the, the heavens opened up and it was just, all right, this ain't so bad. And in the meantime, I'm eating full fat meats, full fat cheeses, no more of that fat free crap, low fat crap. I was eating full fat everything. And I ended up losing, what was it, 30 pounds in that first month. 
And then I lost another 40 pounds in the second month because I was so energetic after one month of, and losing 30 pounds, even at 380 pounds at that point, I was so energetic, I had to wiggle my body. So I went to the YMCA, got on the treadmill and was walking and walking uh, like three miles an hour, which is obscenely slow to me now. But back then it was a big deal. And I tell people I was weightlifting because I was walking on the treadmill carrying a lot of weights. So I, uh, I do have very strong legs today because of that, I think. But um, yeah. And then after the end of 100 days, I lost 100 pounds. And I'm going, all right. And I wasn't ever hungry. I was not craving. I had moments where early on that I had craving, but that craving quickly went away. I'm enjoying delicious meals. And it, it, in the summer of that year, I kind of went, I could do this forever. Like a lot of people's mentality of diets is, I'm gonna go on a diet and I'm gonna get off the diet and go back to the way I was eating. And it's like, that's, that's stupid on every level. And so I knew that I not only started a new year's resolution, I started a new life resolution. And I have continued to eat low carbohydrate now for 17 plus years. Wow, that's incredible. So you were doing this way before it was trendy. You know, keto is kind of kind of trendy now. Uh, so back then when you were doing this, did you get a lot of strange looks? I mean, did people think you were crazy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, my family all thought, you're going to clog your arteries. Oh, my gosh. It's just this one time. What's, what's it going to hurt? It's the holidays. It's your birthday. It's this. It's that. And I'm thinking, there's holidays every year. There's birthdays every year. There's always an excuse until you stop having those excuses. And so for me, mm -hmm. it was no excuse. And I, I think uh, one part of the story I did not tell, my brother Kevin, four years older than me, uh, at the age of 32, had three heart attacks in one week. He literally had a heart attack mm. in the hospital, and in the hospital had two more heart attacks that nearly killed him. It ultimately did kill him nine years later at the age of 41. And so he was wow. a emotional factor that got me to really get serious about this. Now, I didn't immediately go keto. I tried low fat, lost some weight, da, 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 kind of rebelled as everybody does, and then it brought me to to, uh, January 1st, 2004, when I actually started this. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a journey for everybody. And, and I, I try to respect where people are on their journey. Not everybody's ready for it. And when you're ready, there's people like me and Greg ready to help you. You bet. So, so back then, I, I, I don't know what books were, were there back then, but uh, you know, with you, especially with your brother having a heart attack, did that make you nervous eating this higher fat and just maybe the, that un, that unknown, you know, I think now that's been disproven, but yeah. I, you know, was there information out there on so that back then? Honestly, a lot of my Atkins journey before I switched into kind of low carb and then paleo ish and then full on keto. Um, yeah, there was trepidation there, Greg, uh, because I mean, look, it was the dominant, uh, force of the day, the books that you were asking about, you know, there was other books out there besides the Atkins books. There was Protein Power was out there. Uh, there was, you know, all these people. But the, the fun part about this for me, the reason I got so into it and why I guess people look to me a bit of as, as an authority now was early on, I had a hunger and thirst to learn more. Why does this work? Why did I not just lose weight, but start feeling good? Why was I so energetic? Why did I have brain clarity like I've never had before? And so for me, it became this, I, I don't know, like a PhD level journey of trying to learn all the ins and outs of this. And so I learned about people like Dr. Westman, people like that guy on the wall back there, Dr. Finney, uh, people like Dr. Jeff Folick, and on and on and on, all the research that's out there, uh, people like the Eads that wrote po the Protein Power book, Dr. Ron Rosedale. I mean, I could go down the list of all the oldie but goodies uh, out there that kind of influenced this. The problem was when I came on the scene, there was no layperson articulating these things. And so I felt like, I had a niche to be able to get all of the information from those guys, put it through my Jimmy filter and then like output it. So it's easier to understand. Okay. Very good. So that's what uh, motivated you, I guess, to start writing the books and yes. become an author and, and all that stuff. 
And yeah. What, what was your what was your first book? Uh, I had been podcasting for about six hundred or so episodes. Uh, I'm at seventeen hundred episodes just for context now, but about six hundred wow. episodes when a publisher said, "Hey, we like what you're doing. You want to write mm -hmm. books?" And I'm like, "Yes, yes, yes, yes." yes. And like, "What do you want to write about?" I said, "Keto." I was like, mm -hmm. "This is 2012." Right off the bat, I said keto, and they're like, eh, "Nobody really cares about that. It's kind of a niche topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we're going to really have that. What else you got?" And I'm like, Ugh. "All right, how about the cholesterol topic? I love, I love to talk about that. Oh yeah, 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 that's the one." And so that's how that's how this book came out first with my major publisher, uh, and then they finally gave me the keto book, and then Keto Clarity came out. And it sold as much in one week as the cholesterol one did in one year. And they became quickly fans of the ketogenic diet. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, that's awesome. So, and, and I want to get into that uh, cholesterol book, but uh, while we're still on keto, so you've been doing this for a long, long time. And, and so you've written books and so you do podcasts. So within that time, like what, what are some of the things that you've learned maybe about keto over the years that you can just share with, with the listeners, if, if they're thinking about getting started, if they've listened to my podcast, I mean, they've, they, they're familiar with keto and familiar with the concept, but just what are maybe some of the things that you've learned over the years? Can I tell you one thing about keto today compared to even like the early days of, of like when I got started, there is so much information out there now. When I started the Live in La Vida Low Carb Show, you want to know how many total podcasts there were in the entire world? 900. Mm. I was literally one of the first ones. I think I was one of the first health podcasts on, online. Mm. Um, and, and so 900. Now there are a million podcasts. Yeah. So information overload. You've got all these influencers. Social media didn't exist when I started. The, the freaking iPhone that I'm talking to you on didn't even exist when I started. So I think the biggest lesson I've learned is don't get overwhelmed by all the information. You're listening to Greg on his podcast. You listen to me on my shows. You read my books. You, you see, stick with people that you trust, people that you know are giving good information. And here's the caveat too. Stick with people who don't tell you what to do, but say, here's information. Now go do your own research on what I've shared. That's kind of a key here. And it's, it's a sad state we live in that we want more information to be in people's hands, but in that excess of information, people get overwhelmed, they get confused and they don't know what to do. And when you become overwhelmed and confused, what happens? In action, you just don't do anything. Okay. Very good. So how much total weight did you lose doing this? So in 2004, uh, that year, I lost uh, 180 pounds that year. And obviously in the years that followed, I have gained some of that back. Uh, and I talk very openly about some of the things that, that go into that besides just getting older. Um, insulin resistance is definitely a big factor. Stress is an underserved part of this whole equation. I don't think we have enough people, and I, I'm sure you do on your show, but it's such a metabolic disaster when you allow chronic stress to remain. Stress in and of itself is not bad. Mm -hmm. There is a thing called hormesis. Go look it up, guys. Hormesis, hormetic effect has good things. When you go to the gym, that is a freaking hormetic effect on your muscles, and it's a good thing. But long-term chronic stress that just stays there and stays there and stays there without ever getting resolved is going to result in you gaining weight, even if you're eating perfectly low carb keto. Perfect. Okay. So 180 pounds is what you lost. That, that's, yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So congratulations. So thank you. Um, okay. So let's get in a little bit to cholesterol. I actually, I've been wanting to talk about cholesterol for a while now on the show and I haven't, uh, and I've, uh, here in, I don't know, a few weeks, I've actually got a cardiologist coming on to discuss this. Uh, so, oh, who? Uh, Dr. Ali, N Nadir Ali. Uh, yeah, Nadir. Uh, yeah, you're familiar with him? Yeah, yeah. So, so we're going to talk about it some more in the future, but, um, so, so you wrote this book, The Cholesterol Clarity, um, and yeah, so and you interviewed a bunch of experts in the field. So it was a little bit different format in that you, instead of just writing, you kind of interviewed, got their, um, got their thoughts on, on the different um, topics of cholesterol. So, you know, I guess 
let me go back. You know, you, you're so you're eating keto. You, you have a family history of heart disease with your brother dying. So you um, you had to be concerned about cholesterol because that's all you yeah. hear out there is, oh my God, you know, you're eating this high fat. It's going to kill you. You're going to get high cholesterol. So just just kind of talk about your research in that, and then kind of your motivation to uh, you know to write the book, and then we can get into to the specifics of the book. Right, and not just my brother. My dad had a heart attack at 48. He had another heart attack at 50, and at 54, he had quintuple heart bypass surgery. So, wow. and and then I've had some other family members also have heart health issues. So yeah, it's real. You got a strong um, family history. About it today, as I was then, because I know epigenetics supersedes genetics. So that expression of that gene, I'm doing my heart a hardest job working hard to make sure that expression of the gene through diet and lifestyle will be a more positive one than one leading to heart attack. But my interest in this was when I went after losing 180 pounds on the Atkins diet, I went to see my doctor right around the corner over there. And I, whoa, wow. Oh my gosh. You've lost a lot of weight. And I said, yeah, a little bit. And he saw that it was 180 pounds. And whoa, wow. Wow. I said, How'd you do it? And I said, the, um, the, because I knew what was coming next. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, we need to check your cholesterol. I'm like, <laughs> knock yourself out. Like I'm mm -hmm. 180 pounds less in weight. I don't care what my cholesterol is. I, I don't know where it came. And maybe you can explain it as a medical professional. Where did it come? The cholesterol became the totality of what your health mm -hmm. is. But th this guy just went crazy. He said, oh, we got to test your cholesterol. Okay, fine. So he tests it and he comes back and he's got this somber mood on his, oh my goodness. I'm like, what? He said, your cholesterol's bad. I'm like, well, what is it? He said, 240. I'm like, that's bad? <laughs> yeah, 100. I'm like, let's look at the other numbers. I was already educating myself a little bit on this stuff. I said, what's the triglycerides? 43. Mm. That's friggin' good. Anything yeah. under is spectacular. That's awesome. uh, means you carbohydrate restrict really well when you're under 100, by the way. Uh, and then I was like, well, what about the HDL? That's the good cholesterol. It was 72. Hmm. Again, anything over 50 is good in that realm. And I'm like, what are you so upset about? It was literally the LDLC and the total cholesterol. And so I started digging in in the months and years after that and going, why do they worry so much about that? Well, the reason they do is they got a little pill that I talked about in chapter five of mm -hmm. cholesterol. They got a little pill that will brilliantly bring down your LDLC and by extension of that, your total cholesterol. And that's the statin medications, which they made for a while there before it went generic, 29 billion dollars a year it was the biggest pharmaceutical drug in the history of mankind yep. and he was just so upset because what a lot of patients don't realize and you can definitely confirm this for me there is this thing called standard of care that mm -hmm. doctors have to follow and if you don't follow the standard of care on various disease states or markers then you as a doctor get deemed mm -hmm. right absolutely Yep. And so standard of care for someone over 200 total cholesterol or 100 LDLC is a statin medication. Although in just the past year, that standard of care has changed. I don't know if it's trickled down to the medical doctors yet, but the new standard of care as of 2020 is you first have to, if someone asks for it, you first have to give them a CT heart calcium score. That way they can see if there's any actual disease progression going on because high cholesterol is not a disease. The only disease is calcified plaque in the coronary arteries. That's right. the disease. That's what killed my brother. That's what gave my, my dad his heart attacks and ended up having to have the quintuple heart bypass. If you're squeaky clean and have a zero score, then it doesn't matter what your total cholesterol is. And so that's the new standard of care whether people knew that or not. So if you get a doctor trying to push a statin medication before pushing a CT heart scan, you need to push back. Yeah. Um, that's, I didn't know that. That's good to hear. Um, I think it's going to be a while before that trickles down to, you know, normal standard we had of care. Going on, we had a few things going on in 2020 that yeah, might have yeah, just... Yeah. 
And but gosh, there's still, you know, doctors and patients have been inundated for so many years about cholesterol. It's going to take a long time to change. You know, cardiologists, I, I tell patients this all the time when we're having this discussion, you know, uh, not that cardiologists are bad. I mean, they're well-meaning, but they have blinders on and they're like cholesterol bad, cholesterol bad. And yeah. that's, that's the way they think. And a lot of doctors, cholesterol bad up, your numbers up, you need to be on a statin. I mean, you know, every, everybody knows silly that if your cholesterol's up, you need to be on a statin. I mean, that's just the mindset of the, of the medical community and, and, you know, and patients, you know, if you uh, apply for life insurance, they come out, uh, they, check your, they check your cholesterol. If your cholesterol's high, you get dinged, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. I, I can't get life insurance for that reason. Cause mine does tend to run a little bit higher. And I mean, there's surprising reasons why it can be high. Uh, one of the things that I discovered in the writing of Cholesterol Clarity, and I told this story in there, was I had mercury amalgams in like all four corners of my mouth. I had four root canals in my mouth. And I remember I was doing a, a tour, a speaking tour across Australia. And I met this holistic dentist in Sydney. And he's like, you've got high cholesterol, don't you? I'm like, how would you know that? He said, I can see in your mouth, you've got some work done. He's like, if it's mercury, it's going to raise your cholesterol. If you've had root canals and they're now infected, it's going to raise your cholesterol. So the cholesterol responds to inflammation. So when you've got inflammation going on because of heavy metal or because of infection, it's going to show up in your total cholesterol. Now, how many people go to their doctor and get a 310 total cholesterol and the doctor's like, oh my gosh, you need to go see your dentist. N none, exactly none. And, and yet, look how profound it could be. I went and got all that cleaned up. I told this story in Cholesterol Clarity. I got all the mercury amalgams taken out and, they, and done safely. They got the hazmat suits and everything, and covered my face and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then they cleaned up. I had I had infections, major infections, where I could taste like metal and taste like pus, and it was just gross. Uh, and they cleaned all that up. Well, my in six months after doing that, my total cholesterol dropped a hundred points. <laughs> Profound. Interesting. Yeah. No, that is that's that's incredible. Well, let's break down a little bit the the standard cholesterol panel that you know. So when you go to your doctor, you're going to get a standard cholesterol panel. So you're going to get a total cholesterol, which really, as we've you know, briefly touched on, means nothing. Meaningless. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, so you're going to get a triglyceride level. You're going to get HDL, which is the, the good cholesterol. You're going to get LDL, which is so-called the, the bad cholesterol. LDL-C. Um, yes, that meaning calculated, yes. Right. Uh, um, so let's break those down just a little bit. So, so LDL... Uh, again, is the so-called bad cholesterol. So uh, talk a little bit about that when you, you know, interviewed all these doctors and just maybe, I don't know how, how deep you want to go. I know with LDL cholesterol, there's different size particles of cholesterol. Yeah. And, and as I've learned, it, it really, um, even the overall LDL doesn't matter if, if maybe some of the other parameters are good. But what we're more concerned about is the oxidized LDL or maybe the right. smaller particles. So just, just kind of talk about LDL for a minute. So let's camp out on LDL-C for just a moment. So you alluded to it earlier. The C, uh, it will help you remember it anyway, is a calculated, estimated number. A lot of people think, okay, everything on that traditional standard lipid panel is directly measured. They directly measure HDL. They directly measure triglycerides. They directly measure VLDL, which is a surrogate of your triglycerides anyway but then they don't directly measure your LDLC. They put it through this thing called the Friedwald equation. And so it's estimated based on your other numbers. But the problem here, especially those of you that eat a low carb ketogenic diet, that estimation, that calculation of your LDL is completely off when your triglycerides are under 100 and your HDL is over 50. Now, how about that? It could be off by as much as 100 points. And so that's not good news if you're trying to get accuracy, and especially if a doctor is pushing a dangerous medication on you to fix this disease that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big problem with LDLC. 
it's not directly measured. And so we will get into a, a bit of the particle stuff here in a second, but that is a big take home. I hope you, you understand LDL, you should never base any medication or treatment or anything just on that LDLC. So what can you look at? You should look at, and, and we're gonna get into those other things here in a second. You should look at the triglyceride to HDL ratio, which we'll talk about in a second. But LDL is more than just one number. But we've always heard it at, well, my LDL is 175. Oh my God, I need a statin. But LDL can be good and LDL can also be bad. And so if you run a more advanced uh, test for your cholesterol, and I'm sure you do this in your office, NMR lipo profile is the big one out there. Uh, nuclear magnetic resonance is what NMR stands for. It's from this company called LipoScience in North Carolina, and they will run the particle size test. So if you go to your doctor and you say, hey, I want to get that particle size test, that's what they'll run is the NMR. There's another one called VAP, and there's a couple other ones, uh, but NMR tends to be the standard one that most doctors run if you ask for it. Most don't run it on their own. So you get it back, and you get and not just an LDLC, you do get that, but you also get what's called an LDLP, which is your total number of particles in your blood. But it's on top of that, the breakdown of how many of them are kind of the, the more large buoyant LDL and how many, like you alluded to earlier, are the small dense LDL particles. And it's the small dense ones that when my brother had a heart attack, he obviously had a lot of small dense uh, particles. Same with my dad, same with anybody that has heart disease develop. It's because of the small dense LDL particles easily penetrating the arterial wall, leading to that inflammation, leading to becoming oxidized, like you were mentioning earlier. And oxidation, literally think of it like a, a rusty bicycle. Uh, that's what's happening with that LDL. Meanwhile, this large fluffy, which is called pattern A, a small dense one, it's preponderance of your LDL is called pattern B. Pattern B is the dangerous, bad, that's what B. Pattern A is awesome because those big, large, fluffy, they're just kind of floating around in there doing their thing, but they're not harming you because they can't penetrate the arterial wall. So that's kind of the best layman's terms I can do on LDL. Yeah, very good. Um, okay, so so HDL is is the good cholesterol, um, and you know you alluded to to triglycerides. Um, when I'm looking at a standard cholesterol panel, and I didn't know this. Uh, before I start studying all this, but now I pay more attention to triglycerides and I think triglycerides are much more indicative, you know, of your overall health and, and risk yeah. of, of, you know, heart disease. So, so talk a little bit about maybe HDL and triglycerides. Yes. So in all the research circles, there's this thing called an HDL to triglyceride ratio. So you, let's take the numbers I had right after I lost the weight on the Atkins diet. I had 43 triglycerides and I had a 72 uh, HDL. That's about a uh, two to one ratio of HDL to triglycerides. When you run that triglyceride to HDL ratio, it was like right at 0.5. Under one is spectacular. Which that's so awesome, yes. Your numbers, uh, and you can just run it through the equation. Let's just say your triglycerides are 60 and your ACL 60. It's exactly one. And so that is a great, great measure that your heart health is probably in good order. Now, obviously, there's other factors involved. Stress can actually supersede that, other kind of things. But overall, if you've got that triglyceride to HDL ratio in a good spot, at least from a nutritional and lifestyle perspective, that's going to put you in a, in a, in a good uh, place. But these triglycerides, guys, people don't even pay attention to, doctors especially, what triglycerides are. I, I remember hearing people talk about, oh, my doctor loved my total cholesterol. It was like 197. He was just happy. Now, send me your whole panel. And they'd send the whole panel. And yes, it was 197 total cholesterol, but it's 20 HDL, which is very low. Mm -hmm. You don't want it to be under 50. It really should be 50 or higher if you're eating low carb with healthy fats. It should easily be over 50. And oh yeah, by the way, you ladies, we hate you. Us, us guys, we hate you because your HDL naturally goes higher than ours. I could eat saturated fat, which is a good way to raise your HDL, 
and I can get it just so high. I think the highest I've ever seen is 79. Women can see 115, <laughs> 101, so they can really pop high on the HDL. And I think it's probably more to do with their female hormones that kind of, they need that HDL for purposes in the body. Uh, but it's, it's a good way to, to get that up. And then the triglycerides is truly the bad fat. I wish, like you said, you go right to the triglycerides when you look at a standard lipid panel, that is the bad fat, uh, not LDL. We need to reframe what the real bad fat is. And these triglycerides are just all in your body. And the biggest culprit in making them go high is carbohydrate intake. And so Absolutely. when you cut carbs, that is a telltale sign to you as a doctor. If you put somebody on a low carb ketogenic diet and then they come in and they got a 197 trig, you're like, all right, what's in your diet? Cause you already know based on that number, yeah, they probably got a few more carbs than they're even realizing. Oh, I had the whole wheat toast for breakfast. Is it that keto? No, that's not keto. And so you, you find out really quickly where the sins are in their diet. But yeah. it's an interesting kind of way to view things when you look at things through the prism of triglycerides and HDL rather than total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Yeah, so isn't it ironic that, and I tell patients this all the time, and they just look at me like I'm crazy, but isn't it ironic that the way we get to a, uh, a more healthy cholesterol panel, which is by raising HDL, lowering uh, triglycerides, is a high-fat, low-carb diet, um, which is what's been vilified all this time, you know, uh, the, the high-fat, of course, causing high cholesterol, but that's how to improve the cholesterol panel. Do yeah. you think the American Heart Association is ever going to get it? Is ever going to well, get that right? When I first started blogging 15 plus years ago, 15, 16 years ago, I never thought the American Diabetes Association would get it either. But look where we are now. Two years ago, the new president of the ADA is a diabetic who eats a low-carb diet. So guess what? It's in their recommendations now along with the standard diabetes diet that they've always pushed, but they're like, you know what? We're gonna give people another option. If you would like to use a low carbohydrate approach, we know it has efficacy in the science and so we promote it. So if we get somebody on in a big wig position at the AHA, sure, I think it could happen because I never thought it would happen with the ADA and here we are. So yeah. I hold out hope, but yeah, right now, it's just a, a hopeless battle. Uh, I, I personally don't think it's going to change anytime soon because big pharma is, right. is just way too influential in, in right. things. And so I don't know, we'll, we'll see, but so, uh, cor correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so this is kind of what I've learned and this is, this is what I tell patients, uh, short of getting kind of the, the more expensive, uh, advanced lipid panel, which some insurances may pay for that. Some may not. Yeah. Uh, so if we are just looking at the standard cholesterol panel, if somebody has uh, a triglyceride to HDL ratio of one to one or less, like in your case, I don't care what the LDL is or, right. the, or the overall cholesterol is. I don't right. care because that's a kind of a, I guess, a poor man's uh, way of knowing that if your LDL is high, most of that is going to be the big fluffy particles, which don't mean yeah. anything. Is, yeah. is, would you agree with all that? I don't, dude. I think that if you're looking for uh, a surrogate marker for what that small dense LDL versus large fluffy is, if the triglyceride to HDL ratio is under one, I can almost take it to the house, take it to Las Vegas and bet on that you have mostly large fluffy LDL firmly in that pattern A. Yeah. So we, you know, I, I mentioned the A, uh, American Heart Association. Um, <laughs> do you think that cardiologists are going to get this because most cardiologists don't get this concept. Yeah, I think people like Dr. Ali, who you're going to have on soon, I'm hoping he can influence his colleagues because as you're going to see when he comes on your show, he lays out the science very clearly. The science is indisputable about this. Mm -hmm. Let's hear it out. And, and he'll, he'll even give some caveats to try to meet medical people halfway. Okay, yeah, if you get a certain number, okay, let's consider statin medicaid. He'll, he'll talk their language. But overall, he's trying to push them to diet and lifestyle that's going to make these numbers better. Mm -hmm. So in your research and interviewing all these doctors, um, 
most of them, what is their thought on using statin medications? I mean, is there, uh, is there just certain populations that would actually benefit from, from a statin? I actually asked that question of just about all of them and all the practitioners. In fact, Dr. Jeffrey Gerber, if my memory serves correct, I asked him that and he's like, the only case where I would give uh, the patient a statin medication is if I give them instructions on the diet and lifestyle changes to make and they refuse to do it. At that point, then I do the statin just to try to have something happen to save their life. Uh, because the statins, I mean, I know we like to vilify them a little bit, but they do serve a good purpose. And it's not to lower cholesterol. People are, oh, it lowers cholesterol. No, we're now finding from the research that the benefit you get from a statin medication, Lipitor, Crestor, Zocor, for those of you that don't know what statins are. Um, I was on both Lipitor and Crestor at one point, so I know all about them. Um, but the benefit they give you is they lower inflammation. Mm -hmm. But my thinking is, okay, well, if that's their benefit, guess what does that as well? Not eating sugar and grains and crappy garbage, as I like to call it. And so I don't know about you, but I'd rather not have the side effects that come with a dose of statin uh, and enjoy delicious, high fat, low carb foods that I know will do the exact same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. And I think um, statins can even be uh, detrimental not only oh, yeah. the side effects of the actual medication, but there are yeah. many cardiologists, and I fight this battle all the time, there are many cardiologists who, well, and, and just general practitioners who believe still that the lower the cholesterol, the better, specifically the LDL, the lower the better. And I think we're obviously in a time now of the pandemic, uh, and that can affect your immune system. I mean, cholesterol serves a purpose, and I've actually uh, had some elderly people um, who come down with COVID and I, they're on a statin and I say, stop your statin. Uh, now I don't know what that's going to do in the, in the short term, but you know, cholesterol plays a role in a lot of things. And, and so oh. I, th I think this idea of the lower, the better LDL is, is not only wrong, but it, it, it's dangerous. Yeah. I tell the story in cholesterol clarity about Tim Russert. You guys remember Tim Russert from NBC's yeah. Meet the Press. Mm -hmm. And he had uh, no history of heart disease in his family. Uh, and he was eating healthy, he healthy, I will do that because using low fat. Um, and he was riding on a treadmill and just doing the, all, all the everything. And he was taking a statin drug. Guess what his total cholesterol was uh, right at the time that he died? Yeah, I don't know. Because he had a heart attack is what mm -hmm. his very first heart attack. It was 105. Hmm. So he had that super dippity low uh, cholesterol. And I've done some research since then. That low of cholesterol, guys, is going to start messing with your noggin because whether you realize it or not, your brain is full of fat and cholesterol. Your whole body is full of fat and cholesterol needing these things. And so he was basically starving, even on a statin medication he was starving his body of all the things it needed to protect him. And the reason he fell susceptible to his very first heart attack ever, oh yeah, by the way, at 54 years old, nobody's supposed to die of heart, heart, a heart attack at 54, but he did because that body was unprotected. Cholesterol is a protective measure in your body. It helps, uh, normalize your hormone levels like people don't realize that if you have inflammation in your body which is what tim russert had i think his hscrp which is a key inflammation marker uh was like 15 in his body it was like off the charts high it's supposed to be under one and it was 15 um so yeah these kinds of things that this is what so this is why I wrote the book, why I wanted to kind of get this message out there is we have so many bass average ways of looking at this topic that people are getting the exact wrong information. And so they follow that wrong information. And when you follow wrong information, it eventually leads to calamity. Yeah, yeah I couldn't, couldn't agree more. And I love the fact that you mentioned inflammation and, you know, that's really where it's at. And that's where the focus should be. Is, yes. is inflammation and decrease inflammation and not cholesterol. Yeah, I don't know how you, you mentioned it earlier. I don't know how that cholesterol became this, 
you know, end all be all marker for your, for your overall health. But I mean, I'm sure it had, I'm sure it had to do with big pharma, but it's big pharma, big pharma said we can make a crap load of money if we test people's cholesterol and tell them we can lower it because from a, from a marker perspective, it's easy to lower that total and LDL cholesterol with statin medication. What it does though, by the way, the way it works and, and even like vegetable oils, you know, all the seed oils that, yep. eat, that also lowers your cholesterol, but here's how it works, guys. It eliminates the large fluffy and at least behind the small dense. And then, oh yeah, by the way, it oxidizes the small dense, which makes you even more susceptible. So when you take a statin medication or when you drink vegetable oils, which is in every American food these days, you actually do lower your cholesterol, but what you do is you increase your risk of heart disease. Ironically, right? Like 12% increase in heart disease, taking a statin drug, oh my God, 10% increase in the risk of getting diabetes, an 8% chance of uh, risk of raising the risk of cancer. Like this is from taking a drug that's supposed to keep you heart healthy and oh yeah, by the way, there's a study that came out where admissions to hospitals for some kind of cardiovascular, something going on, chest pain, heart attack, something going on. And you would think the vast majority of the people that had a heart attack or had a chest pain or whatever would have very high cholesterol. Half of them had very normal cholesterol. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. You would think the preponderance of them, 90%, 75, 80, 90% would be that. It was half meaning it ain't the cholesterol yeah yeah for sure um yeah there, i can't remember what book it was i was reading and it was a cardiologist and you may know but uh, uh who, who, who said who, and, and the quote just kind of stuck in my head he said that this cholesterol that we're discussing is the uh biggest i think his word was farce he said it's the biggest farce in our modern day history um yeah. and, and that just kind of stuck quote kind of stuck in my head so is that, is that Stephen Sinatra, his book, The Great Cholesterol Myth? Uh, it doesn't ring a bell. I don't know. It's been a while since I've read it. but Yeah. Malcolm Kendrick also did a nice book called The Great Cholesterol Myth. Anyway, I can name yeah. all the people yeah. who wrote real cholesterol books. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's – so what, what would you recommend for people – you know, who, who come in with, with really high triglycerides and, and, uh, you know, really, really high, you know, just overall cholesterol as far as from a, yep. from a lifestyle, from a diet standpoint, you know, we're talking about keto, uh, what would you recommend, uh, for people, you know, as far as kind of getting started down that path of improving those markers? Right. So the best way to drop your triglycerides, there's no drug that will do this, by the way. There is literally no drug, and you can confirm this for me, that will lower triglycerides, right? There's none. Yeah. Maybe a certain drug. Fish oil might help a little, but it's yeah, certain. Yeah. I wouldn't even put that in the drug category. I, I know there's there's pharmaceutical yeah. grade of, of fish oil, but you can take fish oil over the counter. Right. Definitely fish oil would lower it, but carbohydrate restriction is the key, guys. Like if you go see Greg as a patient and, and he looks at your chart and he sees 225, he knows you're overeating carbohydrate because it's a telltale sign someone is carbohydrate restricting well that your triglycerides will easily at least go and trend towards under 100. So that's going to be the first and foremost. And it's not that hard. Like I would even say do it as an experiment for a period of time. If you have high triglycerides, Go home for the next 60 days, just eat meat, meat and animal-based foods. It's not going to kill you. There, it is a thing. It's called carnivore. Go look it up. Yep. But go do a carnivore diet for 60 days. Eat all the fatty meats you want. Just don't eat carbohydrate. Then go get retested two months later. I would be shocked if it didn't fall dramatically. Yep. So that's, that's the biggest thing that I would do for triglycerides. As for total cholesterol, why are you worried about total cholesterol? Who cares? Because yeah. The analogy I use a lot when I'm interviewed about cholesterol, knowing your total cholesterol is like knowing the end of a baseball game cumulatively is 30. Was it a 29 to one blowout win or was it a barn burner 16, 14? You don't know. So there's no context for what total cholesterol is. So it's meaningless to even know that your total cholesterol was like 260. What does that mean? 
and, and even in the context of this 200 number, let's, let's camp out on that just a second, because this is so fascinating. And again, you can confirm this for me, uh, being a medical professional, most of the lab values that you see as in the range of what good is and what bad is, um, is based on percentile. So what percentile above this number gets sick, what percentile below, and usually the percentile is somewhere around maybe 75% of the population, meaning that number, if you're above that percentile, you're at great risk for disease. If you're below that percentile, you're at lesser risk. 75%. Guess what it is for cholesterol? Guess what that 200 is based on? It's not the 75% per percentile. It's 50 percentile. Meaning they think half the people with cholesterol have too high, half the people have too low. And they're even talking about lowering it to like 180, 170. So it's like they have to move the goalpost to make more people sick for something that was never a sickness to begin with. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. So, well, very good. Uh, well, anything else um, before we kind of start wrapping up that, that you want to throw out there that I didn't ask you? Dude, I could talk about anything all day, every day. <laughs> I, I think most uh, importantly in my mind, as a lay person who tries to educate people, I try to be uh, engaging and, and informative, but you you listening to this, watching this, you are in control of your health. Uh, Greg is a nice guy and doctors, they have the best intentions, I'm sure, with their patients. But at the end of the day, they aren't the boss of you. You don't have to listen to everything they have to say. They are merely a consultant in your health. At the end of the day, you are the final arbiter in what you do about your own health and stop abdicating your responsibility to those doctors, the man in the white coat. White coat syndrome, I know, is a kind of a relic of the past. Some of the newer, younger generation, not as enamored by white coat syndrome anymore. And that's good. Like, I think we should have the ability to think for ourselves and take control of our health. That's why we let it get out of control with weight and health markers, because we didn't take a vested interest in it. We just blindly believed that our doctor had our best interest in mind. And there's good ones out there like you, Greg, but not all of them are looking after your best interests. So that would be my final edification of be your own best health advocate. Yeah, and that's fabulous advice. And I couldn't agree more. Uh, I was, uh, uh, as, as this podcast is getting more popular, I was asked to be a guest on another podcast. And so they nice. kind of asked me with, with uh, you know, my, my final thoughts. And that was, that was exactly what I said, what, what you just said to, for people to take control of their own health, not rely on everything your doctor tells you. And this is coming from a doctor. Uh, and, and, you know, I tell people all the time, the healthcare industry is not designed to make you healthy. It's a, right. a money-making machine. Uh, and so now we can help and I can ad advise people, I can coach people, but don't rely on your doctor to make, you know, to, to make you healthy. Do your own research. No, they're, they're, they can be a team player, but uh, yeah, you, you, you said it very well. So, um, so I always in this, maybe what, what you're, you're going to say, just what you said, but I always uh, kind of end the show with asking my guest if they could leave us with one health tip that can make us healthier today. Uh, what, what would you say? Oh, the biggest health tip that I would say, and it's a non-diet one. Chill out. Like I think ah. so many people... <laughs> constant uh, state of sympathetic state, they never learn how to chill. And, and I'm speaking to Jimmy Moore as much as I am anybody else, because I've had to learn. I did a six month sabbatical a year and a half ago, and it was the best thing I ever did in my career because I'm a go, 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 go kind of guy. Uh, it's why I write so many, I got nine books. And so I actually took a year off from writing books and whew, okay, breathe. Um, but like learn to chill. Like I, I am very blessed. I have a hot tub that I kind of chill out in. I've got an infrared sauna. I got like a little massage here. Just learn that that stress has as much of an impact on your body as any food you put in it, as any lack of movement that you do. So put just as much emphasis on de-stressing and meditating and getting sunshine and all the things that are outside the nutritional health world 
because we always think, okay, well, my diet's not working anymore, so I'm going to quit my diet. No, your diet's probably fine. It's all these other things that you're not pay being mindful of. So be mindful of the other things, and stress is the big one. Yeah, yeah, great, great advice, great advice. So. Well, all right. Well, uh, we appreciate your time today, and uh, I'm certainly grateful for – uh, your expertise in this field and you paving the way, uh, you know, for uh, just educating people uh, about keto and just, uh, you know, the influence you've had just on me and my wife, as I, I told you before the show and, and learning about keto uh, just for our own health, but, but um, translating that over to patient's health. So just appreciate everything you've done uh, in this field just to make people healthy. Thank you. I'm not going anywhere. I feel like in some ways I'm just getting started. Awesome. Well, that's awesome. Well, all right. Well, um, guys, thank you for listening and uh, we will talk to you next time. All right. Well, very good. Well, Dude, thank you very you much. That was great. Voice. And I love your voice for podcasting, man. It's awesome. Oh, really? I had to uh -huh. develop a bit because I'm not a natural, I was not before I started a natural speaker. Uh, but you are, you, you've got a really like rich voice when you're talking. Wow. Well, that's interesting. You say that because, um, I, I, I guess, you know, we're, we're all more self-conscious, you know, uh, or, or more critical of ourselves than, you know, we should be, but, but I'm always thinking, gosh, my, my voice is so monotone and, and no. bland. No, uh, well, and, it's a little more than mine is, but I've developed mine over the years. Your voice it's got that nice kind of radio style voice and <laughs> kind of like chilled over to the side and cocked it sideways. The only thing I would offer as a constructive uh, criticism is just be a little more relaxed. It felt like my energy, you fed off of it a little bit, but it was almost like, all right, you had a preconceived question next, let right. go of kind of that. And you know, this stuff, you don't have to prepare. It's good that you had questions and every one of your questions were wonderful, but just roll with it. Like if yeah. you hear something from your guests and you did you commented on some of the things I said, and then, and I'm giving you just podcasting tips. I've done this well, a long sure, time. Yeah. Yeah. Roll with that guest and make it fun. And even like throw in some humor, all of that kind of breaks the tension of this tit for tat question and answer kind of format that I think people are getting tired of. In in my interviewing style, I've evolved in that way. I used to do the whole, welcome back to the Little Lapino Low Carb Show with Jimmy. It was just, it was so fun.